okay? Boundary, you couldn't cut the boundary analysis, help, but not that much. In your, in your project, basically, you need to follow all your test cases and all your scenario and show that your program performed correctly under those scenarios. How do I look at your test plan? Have you covered all the scenario you have identified in your design document? How do I look at that to say, say, have you covered them all? Because already, we already gave you a list. So we made your life a lot simpler. But in reality, how do you come up with the functional types of your, your, your systems? You go back to your use cases, your scenarios, your collaboration diagram, sequence diagram. Okay, those are naturally your functional test cases. Does this make sense? Okay, if you're wondering, so once I'm done with my design, would I ever get, get back to my use cases and see and, uh, and scenarios? Yes, you will. You will. If you're going to correctly test your, test your program, you basically have to generate test cases from your use cases and scenarios. Okay, so then this whole process is a complete loop. Okay, all the way from requirement to the validation stage. So practically, there is, there is always difficulty. Um, for instance, in this case, our program is simple. But just think about, if you want to test your server program independently from your client, okay? Then you have to basically, you have to go work out what kind of communication sequences between your server and client so you can test your client that way. Because your use cases are actually only applying to the, to the clients. Your use cases doesn't directly apply to your server, right? Um, so, so, this is a, uh, this, so this is a case when you have this client server architecture, you have input coming in, essentially coming to your client. Then your client will generate traffic and the interaction with your server, okay? So you are, if you are going to test your server directly without the client, then you have to come up with the test cases and stops for your server, okay? Because your use case in a scenario, they only apply to the entry point of the whole system, which essentially is your client programs, okay? So that's that. That's uh, practically that's going to be a challenge. So if you want to separate testing, then you have to do a little bit more work in terms of stopping and uh, write write testing code. That is also uh, how typically things happens. You actually test your module by create your own module test driven uh, test driven environment for your module. Okay, apply those test cases to your module. All right. So, for instance, this is the this is the MSC Foundation. You, we don't need to really need to care about uh, or the exact, but basically, this is they are applying equivalent classes to the input to test the input combinations, right? So, essentially, apply um, equivalent class analysis and the boundary uh, boundary uh, value analysis to identify what are the combination of the, uh, data they can they need to put into the, your system to test. Okay, so that's the test case you, you come up with with, the, with this equivalent class analysis. Functional test, basically you're following all the scenarios. All the scenarios. In this case, you need both. Because you need your scenario to come up with the sequences. You need your boundary analysis to come up with the, the, the concrete values you are going to send into your system through your use cases. Okay, so you can see that test to specification, you need both. Equivalent class analysis and your, 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 your use case driven test generation. Okay, so this is our pretty much the fundamental way for us to test our system. Certainly, this is not going to be, uh, oh, okay, I'm, not, I'm going to do this. Yeah, this one actually, these two things, 
potentially cover all the system you 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 will you will construct. But this this if you literally just you, you just say oh I'm just going to apply this brute force, then you will have way too many combinations. Way too many combinations. Then you have all the tools and the automation and so forth to help you with analysis. But fundamentally, you need to test all your user stories and your use cases. How do you come up with the data you use in your use cases and user stories to test your system? You use equivalent class and boundary analysis. Okay, these two combinations are the first two testing techniques you should push in your pocket. Okay, they they will they will be useful for you for a long while. And at this stage, and the, these two these two approaches are pretty much sufficient because you are you will be the person sitting in the middle, picking finally finalizing all the test cases. But these are just two frameworks for you to select test cases from. All right, test to specification. Number one, equivalent class and boundary analysis. Number two, your user case, use case driven test generation. You basically test all use cases and all the scenario of your use cases. Okay? This will be our first, if you test some system from outside without looking at the code, this will be your technique. So in our test plan, okay? I'm actually looking for your use case based testing plan and also your equivalent class analysis. Okay? Your equivalent class analysis will not be that complex. Basically, you need to tell me where you need to be worried about out of bound data. What kind of data is considered out of bound? Your system should say, no, no, that's not my data. Okay, I'm not. I'm going to say this is wrong formatting data. Basically, data format. Make sense? What I'm looking, really looking at is, have you test all the use cases? Your plan of covering all the use cases, like this one. Okay. Your, how you're going to enumerate all the scenarios and use cases. And in those tests, what kind of data are you going to use? That will be your equivalent class and boundary analysis. That's it. Well, that's what I'm looking for in your test plan. So should our test plan mention the outcome we expect from each yes. test? Yes, yes. That's the goal. You are actually responsible for because your list there doesn't. No, this one doesn't. So essentially, you have to. These are test cases, okay? This is not your test plan. Your test plan actually have two parts, more than two parts. But the main cr critical part of the test is actually test cases and auto auto your origin result, basically expected result, okay? So. Well, well, basically I'm looking for, okay, for each scenario, I will cover all the scenario. For each scenario, what's your expected output result from your test? Then for each scenario, if you use data, what would be the right format for the data? What data format your system should reject? Okay, that'll be what I'm looking for in your test plan. So then we, the second one is called uh, white box or glass, glass box testing. So this is really looking at your code. This is looking at your code. For this, you have more automation. This is not something we are going to, going to focus on a lot in your test plan. You're encouraged to do so, but we're not going to focus on, um, say, ask you to set coverage targets. So these are essentially typically what you hear about in code coverage test metrics. Okay? Number one is so-called statement 
coverage. That's basically say how many line of code, how, how, what's the percentage of the code you cover after your program. If you use JUnit, I mean, the testing environment, they, they, they will actually generate report for you. Okay, how many, how many uh, use cases, I mean, how many statements you have covered, right? Then you, it also will generate, will also generate so-called branch, uh, branch coverage. Okay, how many branches you have covered? Okay, branch coverage can be can be uh, 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 different. People have different understanding. For instance, your branch coverage can say can be how many branches I hit, or how many branches I have I taken. So there's a difference. If I if I have gone to a branch statement, then once I don't need to go to both both branches. Okay, or I really require to hit both branches. Okay, for any branch, would you are you required to hit both branches? Okay, so in this case you have you, you can use tools, or you can use so-called path coverage, which is, as I we mentioned at the beginning of the class, infeasible to do for large programs. Okay, you cannot do that. And then what's the what's the benefit of having this here? Okay, this is actually our. This is the if you study uh, um, you know, calculus, this is the, the the one you will ever getting close to it, but you will never get to it. Okay, because it's practically impossible. Okay, your goal is to inch closer closer to it. Okay, so essentially you are not going to be able to do the whole thing, so you need to check a weaker condition. For instance, linear code coverage. So, so essentially I didn't even set off a point when uh, 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 basically uh, the, the basic blocks. Okay, essentially you, 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 you will test, uh, see if you have covered all the basic blocks. All the basic blocks. This is not test, test all, the, all the paths. This is just a, a crude approximation of, of past coverage. Then you have all the depth use uh, coverage, basically say any variable that the uh, God defined must be used. And uh, also if you use that variable, that must be defined, okay? Depth chain coverage. So these are the things you can do to approximate uh, past coverage, but not going to be equal to past coverage, okay? So why are we doing this? Because this is something we can do automatically with tools easily. I mean, relatively easily compared to cover all the paths, which is impossible for large programs. If I if I write you a small program which have don't, don't have so many paths, you can probably cover it all the paths. But if you have give you any practical program, cover all the paths is, is all the paths is impossible. All right. So essentially, uh, you know, essentially here. Um, this is the matrix you will get from your automatic testing tools. You also get your from your test, your test automatic testing tools, which uh, give you a daily report and say, okay, what is your statement coverage? What's your branch coverage? What's your branch? branch uh, uh, what, what's your you know, staff use uh, coverage? What what is your um, uh, your your linear code base, basic block coverage? I mean, certainly when these metrics when they are when they are bad, you, they are useful, right? When the number is low, say your statement coverage only like 20%, you know that's, that's definitely not good. Because, well, if 80% of your code is not even tested, what are you doing, right? What are you doing with those codes? However, once your coverage gets to like 85%, 90%, then, the, then actually to increase to 100% is difficult. And also in some cases, do you really need to get to 100%, right? So, so essentially, you may you may be facing a diminishing return. To cover that, the, to increase from 95% to 100%, you may need to spend another three months. You may say, oh, forget about it. I'm okay with 95% at this point, right? Actually, you can spend your time doing other useful things. So, metrics only for your information, not going to be not going to be the only de uh, the, the, the decision makers for you, right? 
what the important concept to know is so-called infeasible, infeasible code, right? Infeasible code is basically no matter how what kind of input you give to your program, you can never get to that code. Then, if your code has your your, your program has infeasible code, you need to ask a, ask yourself a question: Is anything wrong? Right? Maybe it's because your logic is wrong, so your code is not not reachable, or your code is unnecessary, right? Uh, or your code is not ready to be used yet, right? Uh, because the, if the other module is not uh, implemented fully yet, right? So you need to clearly, so infeasible code is always fishy, okay? Infeasible code is something you always need to pay attention to. It's always fishy. Why? Why you have infeasible code? If you have infeasible code, <coughs> you need to be pay attention now, right? Either your logic is wrong, or that code is not, not necessary. Both cases need to be corrected right now. Or you have, you have basically other module not implemented fully yet, so no color to your code yet. Then you need to know why is that the case. Essentially. So that, that is actually, so whenever you see the infeasible code, you say, oh, that's fishy, fishy, I better take a look. If, you, your, if your program crash, there are no arguments, okay? Go take a look. If, you're, if you give it, uh, give your input, you have erroneous output, clearly you need to go debug. Then, if you're taking care of crashes, taking care of erroneous output, and now the next one to look, Infeasible code, okay? The infeasible code is bad because one, on one thing, it's maybe indicator of something wrong with your program. On the other thing, the other hand is, okay, that piece of code is not tested, okay? Later on, if you add the functionality, you may actually be, be, be working with a piece of code that has not ever been tested yet, okay? That is something you need to know and make sure it's got fully tested. So that's why we have come, uh, all kinds of metrics, like coverage metrics, statement, branch, linear code, def and use, and so forth. And so another thing you can use is say, oh, let's see how complex our program is. The most common thing we, we use in terms of complexity is actually linear code, Galileo code. Although everybody knows this, uh, this one is not reliable, right? For instance, in our class project, somebody may finish the program with, in, with using 1,000 line of code. Somebody may finish the program with 2,000 line of code. Should I give the, the guy finish with 2,000 line of code of, uh, extra credit? Any, anybody, uh, anybody agree with that? Why? Why? Wow, this guy worked so hard, 2,000 line of code. You didn't work hard enough, only 1,000 line of code. So he deserved twice as much credit. Why, why is that a bad idea? Really, the quality of code is not reflected by line of code. I'm just a very verbose programmer, right? Something that can be finished with one line of code, I, I have to write three lines. Okay, and it doesn't mean my code is of high quality. Just that I spend a lot, of, spend more real estate on the on coding, basically by generating a lot more code, right? So line of code is not a reliable. You can't just use line of code as a single indicator of work. Okay, a lot of time we do use this as a rough estimate of complexity of the of the program. For instance, I'm really looking at okay for our program. You're really really looking at one or two thousand line of code, okay? That's a big range. If I use that kind of big range, I'm probably using the using these metrics correctly, because really that's a just in just an indicator of one just one indicator and the big is actually a, a very broad brush, okay? However, if I really using this as an evaluation, I'll say okay, one code is one line of code code 
101 line of code is definitely better than 100 line of code, then you know that that's, that's a very incorrect way of using the, the metric. You can use other kind of uh, you know, uh, metrics, which is basically say how many how many branches you have. Um, that, that that is also not reliable, right? So, more branches you have doesn't mean that your program is correct, or doesn't mean that your program is of high quality. Just that this is only a not, uh, only one indicator. So, just like in machine learning, you can't just use one feature. You have to use a lot of features. Then all together. It may actually generate a reliable, reliable result for you. However, if you just use one metric, like line of code or number of branches, I mean, you're you're doomed. You're you're destined to make the wrong decision. Okay, that's why you need statement coverage. You need a branch coverage. You need linear code coverage. You need data use coverage, right? You need a feature point coverage. Basically, say, have you covered all the scenarios and so forth? You need equivalent class coverage and so forth, if you put all these metrics all together, then, okay, if you come up with the score of your reliability of your program, then that score will be a lot more reliable than any individual metric. That's why it's always a combination of testing to specification and testing to code, and in each category, you have to use multiple metrics, okay? So in our test plan, I'm not going to ask you to set up coverage metric, okay? This is actually so-called coverage metric, which, which we, I'm not going to enforce on you guys in this project. But if you have bad code, infeasible code, I, I would suggest that you, you definitely need to look at it, right? In your case, infeasible code is not going to cause great harm. But for others, other programs, infeasible code is just really fishy. Why? Your infeasible code is not 